Hi to folks joining tonight's Unapologetically Progressive event. Uh, we're going to give folks maybe another minute or so to jump on. I see people joining. Um, when you do join the Zoom, please introduce yourself in the chat. Make sure to send your uh, settings to all panelists and attendees. Let us know where you're coming in from. Uh, we are also now streaming live on the Run for Something Facebook. So if you're watching there, hello. And um, we're going to get started in another minute or so. I'm just going to give folks a moment to jump on. I'm going to let my dog bark, I'm going to let the whole family get rowdy. <laughs> Let's just give folks another minute or so. I see we have Candace, we have Nicole, um, we have uh, a few other names I recognize and many that I don't. Uh, Harvey, a reminder when you're introducing yourself to change your settings to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see who's here. Um, let's get started. I am Amanda Littman. I am so excited to be your moderator for tonight's Unapologetically Progressive event uh, in coming to you live from Brooklyn. Um, we are gonna be focusing tonight on Michigan one of the most important swing states in this election uh, with critical both presidential races, Senate races, but most importantly, a state legislative chamber up for grabs, um, which tonight is what we're gonna be talking about. For those of you who are new to Run For Something, very top lines on what we do. Uh, Run For Something recruits and supports young diverse progressives running for local office in all 50 states. We work exclusively with young people running for local office for the very first time. Uh, things like school boards, city council, state legislature. Since launching in 2017, we've identified more than 60,000 young people all across the country who want to run for office, which is bananas. Uh, we've endorsed nearly 1,500, 600 of whom are this cycle alone. Uh, our 2020 class of endorsements is more than 50% uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, more than 50% women, about 25% LGBTQ, and they are incredible. Um, you are going to get to meet three of our amazing candidates and one alumni who is running for re-election out in Michigan. Uh, and I want to explain a little bit why we focused on Michigan tonight as part of our Unapologetically Progressive series. Um, Michigan is by far one of the most important states in this cycle. 16 electoral votes, a Senate race we have a chance to win, and four seats needed to flip the state house. Uh, that's huge. If we're able to flip the state house, we have a chance to make huge progress for working Michiganders. Um, I know Mari, Ranjeev, and Chokwe are going to talk a little bit about what their campaigns are about and about the issues they're focusing on. Uh, before I get to our panelists, I want to make sure to thank our host committee who make tonight's event possible. You know, it's free for everyone to attend. That is only doable because of the people who contributed to support this. So real quick, I wanna thank Leslie Beamer Wagner, Chelsea Mason, Trisha O'Neill, Barbara Friedgood, Rob Joyce, Connor Bronston, Nick Edwards, Christy Edgar, Marjorie Sue, Victoria Smith, Sarah Coombs, John Hageman, Artin Arabshahi, Tracy Lear, and Jilly Allison. Uh, it would not be possible without their generous support that we're able to put on these events. Uh, we've done, this is our second. Uh, we're gonna do three more before election day, each focusing on a different state. Uh, and each more important than the last. Uh, first, I want you to meet uh, Renji Hori, who's a candidate for Michigan House District 21. Uh, he'll tell you his story, but very briefly, he's a father to the two little boys, a husband to a small business owner, a son of immigrants. He understands the importance of enabling our future generations to succeed. He has an MBA, after which he joined Fiat Chrysler, where he's been working to create innovative solutions and prepare Michigan for the future of the automotive industry. Um, I will let him tell his story and talk a little bit about his campaign. Ranjeev, take it away. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks so much for having me. Again, my name is Ranjeev Puri. I'm running for state representative in Michigan's uh, 21st district. Uh, for those not, not familiar, that would be uh, right here. Uh, I'm in southeastern Michigan, uh, which includes Canton, Van Buren Township, and Belleville. And this is actually one of the most rapidly diversifying districts in the entire state. And so there are so many wonderful communities from all over the world that have come to call District 21 home. And so uh, a little bit about myself, as Amanda mentioned, I'm a father to two small boys. I'm married to a, a very savvy small business owner, and I'm the son of immigrants. And, and the reason I bring that up is because it's those experiences that help shape uh, so much about my life and those values that led me to work for President uh, Barack Obama. And so I got started in 2008 um, and then was staff on his 2012 reelection campaign 
Uh, and then I finished my MBA while I was out in Chicago and I moved back to Michigan with my wife. Uh, I took a job uh, in the automotive industry, uh, but more importantly, I got involved and I started helping candidates up and down the ballot and I led uh, efforts to try to activate new communities. And so, you know, upon the way in, in doing this work, I realized there's so many of the in inequities that exist in our society and I knew I needed to fight for a better Michigan. And so, you know, we've talked about a number of times how this is the most important election of our lifetime. And I think it's something that candidates say every election, but in, in 2020, we have so much on the line, social justice, racial justice, economic justice, immigration, misogyny, women's rights, so many of our values are on the line. And so it's imperative that we get this right. Um, and as my wonderful co-panelist, uh, Rhett Manoogian highlighted earlier uh, this week in her op-ed, state legislators have an immense role to play in this puzzle. And so we have a chance uh, in 2020 to flip the Michigan House and start to fight for our shared values. And so our campaign knew it would not be easy. Uh, this is a district, as I mentioned, that's rapidly diversifying uh, and the political demographics have, have shifted. And so this district for the longest time was a Republican stronghold. And over the last few cycles and over the last few years, it's slowly shifted uh, to the left. And so I'm running in an open seat here um, as, as the incumbent is termed out. And if elected, I would actually be the first person of color to ever represent this district in, in Michigan's history. And so our campaign tried to build off of my work uh, from, from the organizing days. And so in a district that's as diverse as ours, we tried to bring our campaign to the community uh, rather than forcing the communities to come to our campaign metaphorically. And so what that means is we led a wide scale effort to talk to every community we possibly could. So we translated our literature into eight different languages um, we mailed households with non-native English speakers in their native language. Uh, we had language-specific phone banks. We had culturally relevant text messaging programs. And so, and we routinely heard lines like, you know, we've been living here for 20 or 25 years, and this is the first time a candidate has reached out to us. And so, you know, the, the unfortunate part about relational organizing is that you really don't know if it's going to work until after the fact. Um, but at least with opening these lines of, uh, of communication with these new communities, we, we activated at least a new donor base and we were able to raise the most amount of funds in, in the district's history. And so as we come into November, I think it's important for all of us candidates to, to spur excitement up and down the ballot. And so really, you know, what I want to do is avoid the mistakes of 2016, at least here locally, when we let some of the dissent from the top of the ticket allow for a drop off in democratic turnout down ballot. And so I really do think if we can start the excitement um, at a more local level and we can bring out more Democrats to vote upwards. And so, you know, specifically to me, I know in our case, we are uniquely positioned uh, to bring out voters and a portion of the electorate that's not normally targeted by others. And so that's why I think that running inclusive campaigns is the key to victory in 2020, uh, especially places uh, like, like Michigan. And so again, thank you, Amanda, for having me. And I, and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you. I think what you're saying about uh, being the first to reach out to, to voters in often 20 years is something we hear from Run For Something candidates constantly. Uh, it's both alarming, <laughs> but also really inspiring to know that at least somebody is talking to these people and giving them a Democrat with a face and a story that they can attach to as opposed to the Democrat they see on Fox News all day. Um, so thank you for the campaign that you are running. Uh, next, we'd love to have you introduce Chokwe Pitchford. Uh, Chokwe is running from Michigan House District 79. Uh, he's running for office because he believes he can unify his community and put working families first. He wants to reform healthcare, to cap cost prescription drugs, uh, change the economy to give working families pathways to the middle class and fix the injustices of our criminal justice system. Uh, Chokwe, take it away. Thank you, thank you for having me. So again, my name is Shokwe Pitchford. I'm running for the 79th district. And a little bit about me and my background. I was actually born in New Orleans, Louisiana, just a little bit before Hurricane Katrina happened because of economic uncertainties. My family moved around a lot, got caught up in the early 2000s crack epidemic. My father was sent to jail. My mother had to raise me alone in Atlanta for a little while before he got out. They got their records at Sponge. They tried to start over to really identify the American dream and make a life better for their kids than what they lived. In Atlanta, we had a good life. I went to public schools and push come to shove, 2007, 2008, the housing market crash hit and took that home from them. And they were in a bit of despair because they were like, we tried to do the right thing. We tried to start over. We tried to do everything the way we're being told to do it. And it's like there was a carrot with a stick being led down the way. So we moved back to Southwest Michigan, where my entire family is from here in Benton Harbor. And 
in 2010, there was a house fire that took another home from us and the insurance companies declined to do anything about it. So we were stuck homeless for a little while. My story is the story of triumph though, because in 2018, there were threats that the Benton Harbor High School was going to be shut down. And in that moment, I got tired of being pushed around by these strange and mysterious outside forces that seem to have so much play on my life when I didn't have necessarily a say in that system. So we petitioned, we got out, we knocked doors, we tried to figure out, okay, how are we going to save the high school? Very reminiscent of like an a 80s coming of age movie. There was a lot of me and my friends out trying to save the world. And it culminated with Gretchen Whitmer actually coming to Southwest Michigan. And she came to Reverend Atterbury's church. I somehow got an audience with the governor that day. And she told me something I will never forget. She said, if you want to see real change, you have to be that change. You cannot wait for anyone else, any politician, any public servant, anyone else to do it for you. You got to get out and bring your message to the community. So at that moment, I decided I was going to run. I was going to go around the district and actually listen to people and see what happened when a politician or public servant put their community first. And I heard a resounding answer. We didn't care how old you were. We didn't care if you were a Democrat, Republican, independent, Marxist, socialist. A lot of that stuff is perpetrated by those with an agenda. People wanted to know, what were you going to do if we gave you the chance to be the state representative? And capping prescription drug costs, fixing our economy so it works for working people and fixing the criminal justice system. That was what people wanted. And we're seeing that in leaps and bounds in this campaign. We're seeing people come out who have never voted before getting registered, getting ready, having a plan, money being flown into this campaign that you have never seen before raised at a grassroots roots level where I believe my average donation is about 15 bucks. Those are the things that are pushing this campaign forward. And there's one story actually from yesterday that I wanted to share because it's so it speaks so much to the type of candidate and type of campaign we're trying to do. I was on the phone with a very staunch Trump supporter. When he first answered the phone, he said, oh, you're a Democrat? I hate you people. You want to burn and loot and steal and destroy this country. And I said, if you give me five minutes, I promise you, you'll have a completely different outlook on myself and the Democratic Party. And he said, you know what? I'll give you two. And we started to have a conversation. And we started to talk about injustices. And I started to make connections in this way. He said, Whenever I go to a store, I'll see a very loud and belligerent black woman and I'll say, why is everybody like that? And I say, interesting that we only classify black people by one demographic or one group that is angering you at the moment. And that somehow speaks for everyone. But when you have white supremacists in the streets chanting, the Jews will not replace us, that somehow does not speak for all white people. And he took a moment and he paused and he said, you know what, you, you have a point. And he actually started to tear up a little bit because he said he has a daughter that has PKU. And it's a very rare disease that for time's sake essentially limits the amount of protein you can have. And it makes you, it's almost like having Down syndrome. He said, when Trump made fun of the man who had the mental illness or the man who was a little bit not as apt as everyone else, the reporter, he said that hit him personally. And he had been trying to repress that for a very long time. And he was lashing out at other people because everyone else had to be the problem. And by the end of the conversation, he was going to vote for me. He was going to vote for the straight democratic ticket. And he said that I single-handedly made him understand racism. And I think stories like that have to be put on a high pedestal because not everyone is a racist. We're not as divided as we as it seems it's just there are so many partisan blinders that people already have a preconceived notion about you before they meet you so if there's one thing you take away from me and my campaign is that we are better than this we will get through this 2020 is not the end because there's going to be problems strife and tribulations after this but we have got to find a way to unify this country because i don't want to see this country go down the way it is Thank you again for having me. I know that got a little emotional there, but I just had to, I had to relay that story because that really touched me yesterday. That's such a powerful story. And I want to get back to once we have done introductions, talk to a little bit about what else you guys are hearing on the campaign trail such that it is right now. Um, our final panelist for this evening is State Representative Mari Manugian. She represents House District 40. Um, at 26, Mari is the youngest woman serving in the 100th legislature and the first Armenian American woman to serve in the Michigan State House. 
Um, she previously served in various capacities at the public service at the federal level. Um, she also worked in the uh, United States Department of State. Um, she is a third generation Armenian American whose great grandparents came to America in the 1920s to escape the Armenian genocide. She earned both her bachelor's and master's at GW. Um, she is a Run for Something alum from 2018 who flipped a state house seat and we are proud to have re-endorsed her for her re-election. Mari, take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Amanda. Really appreciate uh, being invited to be here and with our two, uh, two of our wonderful candidates running for state representative here in Michigan. Couldn't be more excited to be with Chokwe and Ranjeev, of course. Um, so just uh, to start off, sort of like, how did I end up running for this state house seat? Because um, most folks ask me, like, you have an international affairs background. Why are you in the state legislature? That doesn't really make much sense. And I'll tell you why it makes perfect sense. So uh, when I was working in Washington during the 2016 presidential election, I had the opportunity to go to a DNC women's forum um, and just figured like, hey, Hillary Clinton's going to speak at this event. It'd be really great to see the candidate um, and, you know, just hear from what's going on um, during the presidential campaigns. And so I got there and I got to actually see an incredible presentation from Emily's List about the lack of women serving in state legislatures. And um, the first thing that really jumped out to me was that Michigan was near the bottom of the pack for uh, women's service uh, in our state legislature, either the House or in the Senate. And I mean, we, I was in a ballroom with like 300 people just kind of sitting there on my phone and figured like, all right, let's let's see, I know we have term limits in Michigan, like I knew enough about it, um, had remembered from AP government that we had pretty strict term limits in Michigan. Um, in Michigan, you can only serve uh, three two-year terms, so people turn in and out of the legislature pretty quickly. Um, and so I uh, looked up to see when my state representative was term limited, and it turned out he was running for his third and final term in 2016, and so that meant the seat was going to open in 2018. And I kind of, that kind of planted a seat in my head, thinking, you know, um, I think that there just needs to be, uh, the first thing that came to my mind was there just needs to be more women. Um, you know, one of the things that really has stood out to me in my time in the legislature so far is just, um, how folks have decided that it's appropriate to legislate women's bodies when they have uh, no medical experience um, and have no business doing that. Um, and so noticing that um, and knowing that that was something that was happening in my backyard at the Capitol, um, you know, that was something that really struck a chord with me um, and was something that made me really consider running for office myself here. So my district um, has been represented by a Republican for generations. I grew up in this district, which was a really big reason why um, I thought it was important to move um, back home to run for state representative. I wasn't gonna do it in Virginia or Maryland. Um, it was really important to be rooted in community. Um, and having grown up in our public schools here um, and having had these wonderful opportunities that led me to work for Ambassador Samantha Power at the UN um, and a few other offices at the US, um, at the US Department of State you know, it was really important for me to um, fight the brain drain that Michigan is experiencing and move home. I know part of Ranjeev's story was that he received his MBA at the University of Chicago and then moved home. Um, and that's something that's really, um, really, really important. And it's something that I ran on in 2018. And being a young candidate, it was something that actually really struck a chord with the community here because um, I could speak to the fact that I have a lot of friends who are teachers that I grew up with uh, in my school system here, you know, who went to Michigan State, which is a wonderful teacher, uh, has wonderful um, education uh, school, and they ended up moving to other states to become teachers. Some of them have moved back, but many of them have stayed in, uh, particularly in the Chicago area. Um, you see a lot of young people in Michigan moving away. Um, that was something I didn't want to have happen. And so I, you know, moved home and um, ran for state rep and ran in a really tough primary and then also ran a really tough general election. Um, as I mentioned before, my district had never been represented by a Democrat, at least in its current form. And, you know, it was really, um, for me, it was just really important to meet folks where they were. So um, just like the, just like Chokwe and Ranjeev have spoken about, like, a lot of what I did was just organizing neighbors that I had known for my entire life, whether they were Dems or Republicans, it kind of didn't matter. Um, they knew my family, they knew us to be people who were really involved in the community. Um, and, you know, I think, yes, there was a moment where like a light bulb went off. Um, Amanda knows this because I met her on a rooftop uh, before, right before I moved home actually. Uh, Run for Something was having like, an, like it was in its infancy and having this like first fundraiser. Um, and I was like, this seems like an interesting thing. Let me pop over here and see what this looks like. And now here we are. But, um, you know, for me, I think there was a light bulb that went off, but um, I grew up in a family that was really engaged. Amanda, you know, uh, told a little bit about, you know, my family's um, ethnic background and sort of 
you know, coming to America and the way that we came to America, um, you know, it was we, you know, it was a decision that was made, um, you know, we could have ended up settling in Europe or somewhere else, but, um, you know, we came through Ellis Island and chose Detroit. Um, there was a lot of opportunity for working people um, in Armenian culture, especially when folks came over after the genocide. Typically, the men came over first and they sort of lived together in a home. Um, and a few folks went out and worked and then one person made sure they kept the house up and they made sure the bills were paid and everything. Um, and then they sent for their families and that's exactly what happened with us. And so, you know, for me, when I think about like involvement in government, I'm the first elected official in my family, although my dad was really involved in the labor movement for many years. And so those issues uh, that are working families issues were kitchen table issues for us. We talked about it regularly. I, you know, learned about the labor movement from my dad and in a place that, you know, I represent a district with 5% labor density, but did all my school projects on Walter Ruther. So like for me, it was really important to, you know, honor the tradition of working people. And that was something we did on our campaign. Um, you know, this is an unapologetically progressive forum and, you know, people sort of said like, you're crazy to talk about labor unions in your district. Your district has, you know, a lot of business owners. And when we ran, especially in my primary and even in my general election, um, we didn't shy away from the fact that I grew up as the daughter of a union utility worker. That was like not, I wasn't going to eliminate my dad from my story. That would be ridiculous. Um, and so, you know, for me, I think what's really important, something I want to relay on this um, discussion is, you know, running true to yourself is really, really important. And hearing both Ranjeev and Chokwe share their stories in this really impactful way, um, that's what connects with, that's what people connect with. That's how you're able to connect with voters. Um, so they may not agree with you or see eye to eye with you on every issue, but the people have immense respect for you when you put yourself out there like that. Amazing. Um, I would encourage anyone who's watching, if you have any questions to drop them into the Q&A function, uh, we'll be pulling from there. I have a couple for all of you, and I want to start with um, Chokwe and Ranjeev as the sort of up and comers here. What do your campaigns look like right now? What, how are you reaching voters? What is your, you know, we can't knock doors, we can't be out at events the way we'd like. So what are you doing at the moment to, to connect with people in a meaningful way? I, I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> the, um, uh, you know, so you're right. I mean, this cycle is an anomaly. I mean, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, most candidates have a plan. Uh, when they start to run for office and and uh, and, and have an idea of how to think things are going to go, um, we launched our campaign early in 2019 um, and had a very robust campaign plan in place. And then COVID came and and kind of knocked that uh, away from us. And so, fortunately, we had a, a a strong and large team, and we were able to pivot pretty well, uh, relatively. Um, you know, we we raised good money, which let let us to, because um, you know it's all doors and dollars. And so, when you take away doors, uh, unfortunately, the the way the system set up now is just. It, it, our, our primary election uh, was very competitive and we had to spend a lot on paid communications. And then we just pivoted to other digital ways uh, to, to try to do our voter contact. And so we, uh, I think we, we were ahead of the curve in terms of COVID and the severity of it. We canceled all in-person activities right away. Um, and I think we also tried then to, to show creative ways of being a leader. So if you take your ourselves back to kind of the March, April timeframe, we ended up leading a uh, drive to raise funds um, for uh, PPE. And so this is a time when Michigan was hit hard and uh, there was a huge shortage of, of masks and, and, and all the other PPE. And so we raised $5,000, not a dime went to our campaign. We spent all of it um, on taking care of frontline workers. And we did not discriminate on if you were a Democrat or Republican. And we also tried to pay more attention to frontline professions that didn't get the, 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 the PR um, exposure as like healthcare workers. And so bus drivers and food service workers. And so I think it, was, it allowed us to uh, position ourselves as, as leaders in this district. To, and even though we weren't elected, we kind of stepped up and answered the call uh, to take care of our community. And then therefore, we, you know, we, there's no formula for running in a, in a pandemic yet. Um, and then hopefully we don't get to a point where we need one. But um, we, we shot some arrows in the dark as well. I mean, we tried doing yoga, like yoga call, uh, Zoom calls and, and book clubs. Um, and cooking, cooking zooms, and so we tried everything. And uh, but I think it was uh, just the creativity that allowed us to kind of set ourselves apart uh, in, in our primary election. To kind of speak to that, as a younger candidate, I didn't have any experience in 
being a candidate, I've worked on campaigns before. I worked in organizing core in Detroit with some of the presidential debates and things. I've worked on local campaigns of last campaign that ran for this seat. So first time being a candidate, we're like, we're going to knock so many doors. We're going to be at every event. And then COVID happened. And I was like, oh, <laughs> this is going to be difficult. So my team, during the out the first part of the outbreak they were like you cannot stop doing what you're doing you have to keep making calls you have to keep contact because people are going to be at home all day every day scrolling down facebook and twitter this is the perfect time to start to build your following start to really let people know that you're on the right side of this so we diametrically opposed ourselves with our opponent we started talking about that this was real we had to be safe and serious and then from there we started having conversations about this campaign was going to be won or lost on the digital spectrum. We had to create something that was going to be memorable. So I actually, before I got into politics, wanted to be a screenwriter. I wanted to be in the movies. I wanted to act and do all of those things. So I sat down in my computer once again and was like, all right, I need to like write an ad. And it was fun. I started to like think about all these different ideas and we decided to go very, very simple and direct. And if you go to our Twitter, hopefully I'll be able to link that later our ad is up and it got about 42,000 views when we put it out there. And that's where the campaign is right now. We are pushing our message out through all the platforms that are acceptable to me. I told my team we were not going to be doing any door knocking lit drops. Like if I lose because of that, I'm sorry, I lost on a moral thing. I do not want one person getting sick because of this. And campaigns have evolved. We had to start making phone calls, trying to do postcard writing campaigns, whatever you could do to get your message out there. And I'll be honest, I don't think we're losing much. If you know anything about campaigns, there's about a 20% contact ratio when you knock doors. Good campaigns could knock maybe a thousand doors in a week. That means you get 200 IDs. If my campaign has been making four or 5,000 calls with a 5% contact rate, we're about talking to the same amount of people that we were. I think we have got to take a step back in a lot of the campaigns that are running and say, how can we do this the, in a way that keeps people safe? Because I am really, really worried that we're starting to get a little antsy about the fact that Republicans are outdoor knocking and we're not. And it's like, we still have to take the moral high ground and keep people safe. So that's where we are with that. Right, you are singing my song, dude. Mari, what does it look like for you as a, an incumbent running for re-election? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, you know, I'm sort of blessed with the incumbency advantage. Um, and of course, having the um, wonderful opportunity of being a keynote speaker for the DNC also helped us a lot with our name ID. We, um, we already have done, because we did the groundwork in 2018, um, already had a really strong base going into uh, re-election. And so we're just continuing to build on all of that. Um, really, you know, I think one of the things that we did um, that actually not a lot of other state house campaigns did, but we raised enough money last cycle to do a lot of paid phones, um, which was helpful to supplement some of the volunteer work that we were doing. Um, also using an auto dialer has been helpful. Um, that's basically a fancy name for a tool that helps you dial numbers faster. Um, and so you can already have something that's, you know, pre-recorded, so you don't have to leave a message or anything. The candidate can leave a pre-recorded voicemail message um, if someone doesn't pick up. And your volunteers will only be talking to people who pick the phone up. So it helps you get through calls a lot faster. The only thing is you have to have a lot of people using the device at the same time. Um, so we've been doing a lot of that, um, just like the other two, uh, you know, have said. A lot of what we've been doing is, you know, Zoom calls, um, trying to do a lot of um, digital conversations. Um, we're spending heavily on digital engagement as well. Um, and those are all really, really important touch points um, that we're focused on. Um, as you guys are talking to voters, whether it's on the phone or over Zoom calls, um, I would imagine that the number one thing that comes up is COVID. Um, this, if it's not, I would love to hear what else people's, is on people's mind, but what are some of the other things that you're hearing from folks that might surprise people? Um, Shokwe, you wanna go first? Yeah, and I'm gonna take just a quick second to really try to pinpoint this. The thing that I hear the most about on the phone is, why is it like this? Whenever someone really engages in a conversation, they wanna know from a candidate side or someone who really pays attention to politics, why is it so divided right now? What is the reason why you turn on the TV? Like I've had people tell me, look, I don't watch the news anymore. I don't care. I don't listen to this anymore because how could two sides, two different parties not agree on something as simple as this virus is dangerous and this virus is going to hurt people. And the first thing I say is I think there is one side that is very much in favor of keeping people safe and one side that's playing down the science. 
That's what I'm hearing a lot of on the phone is people that are just completely disenchanted with the system. They don't know who they're voting for. That's one thing I think a lot of people would be surprised to know. When you ask the question, Biden v. Trump, there are a fair amount of people who say, I just don't know at this point. I don't know which one of the two of them because they say, I hate Trump, but also so many terrible things are being said about Biden that I just, I don't know what's true anymore. And when, if you know anything about history, when you start to take away basic facts and make everything subjective and everything political, that is a, that is not a good combination. So what I'm trying to do on the phone is bring people back to a place of, look, this is what's happening. This is the record. This is what these two candidates have done. And of course, I'm talking about myself, but I see some of those conversations as a way to say, you're not crazy. The world has not exploded. We just have to find a way to get back to some mutual facts because everyone seems to be in their own thought bubble. And that is just not sustainable. Yeah, I mean, in my district, it's kind of an interesting situation. Most of my school districts are entirely virtual, except for like one of them that has uh, the youngest kids going back to school. Um, and as an upper middle class uh, district, you know, folks are really focused on their small businesses. Um, it's something that's really a huge issue for them, um, making sure, uh, you know, I was just on a candidate forum before I got on here. And one of the really important things I wanted to highlight was um, legislation that we voted for and then also bill package that I introduced um, that would help get grants and loans um, basically create the mechanism to uh, distribute grants and loans out of a particular executive agency here in Michigan and all of those things are super important because you know we're we did a really good job this summer with kind of having like outdoor dining and this sort of like so-called cocktails to go and sort of creating this new environment for our businesses to exist in um, but the weather's going to get cold here in Michigan in about like five minutes and so we have to figure out how we're going to still be able to socially distance in our restaurants um, so they don't go under um, and we know that there could be an, another wave here of the virus with flu season coming um, you know in Michigan um, as Trevor was saying like we got some really big issues with people wearing masks um, and the president continues to come parachute himself in here and rile things up. Uh, Don Jr. and his crew was here in Macomb County yesterday night. Um, and it's just, it's going to create, um, I think it's going to create some hot spots that we're going to have to deal with um, in our respective communities, which is incredibly frustrating. Um, but the thing that we just need to keep doing is just keep our heads down and continue pushing forward with um, either if you're a candidate, good ideas for how we can continue to push ourselves out of this mess. And if you're a state rep like me, continue to, you know, ring the alarm in committee and keep talking about these things and then also bring it home and talk about it in the district. So the big stuff that we're talking about a lot is our small businesses. Yeah, I mean, it's similar for me here to, to what Mari and Chakwe said. The, um, you know, largely in our district, we just see people that are just COVIDed out you know, so to speak, there's just such a level of disenfranchised, people just disenfranchised, you know, and um, I think largely to what Mari was saying, uh, I have a number of small business owners in my, in my district, and they just, they don't know what the future holds for them. Um, I think some of the guidance that's come out from uh, on the, on the federal administration, side just about we don't know when the end when when COVID's going to go away so to speak and it's I think it's going to be in our lives for quite some time um, and there's just so much economic uncertainty on top of the healthcare epidemic and so um, and then you just have people that are just like on top of that like I, I talked to a number of uh, of young families and, and parents um, and so none of our schools locally here are back to to in person and so you have parents like myself that are just balancing life and then now turned into pseudo teachers um, even though we're not qualified to be doing that at all um, and I have such more respect not that I didn't have already for teachers but um, uh, and then you know it's just how do you move on with life when when you're just stressed out in so many different aspects and then and then you have me calling to talk about you know some issues that that might not be top of mind for a lot of people and so like I was saying in my introduction I really think it's the burden falls on us uh, to, to be just uh, tremendous elected officials here um, to understand what the needs are to, to spur that excitement. Because if it's not happening at the, at the, at the top of the ticket, um, then we need to start that uh, and, 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 and take that upwards. Um, and so yeah, it's, uh, there's nothing grossly unique to my district, uh, but I think it's a lot of the same sentiment that, that my co-panelists shared. Um, what do you think would surprise people most about politics in Michigan? or that you think people misunderstand about Michigan politics? Whoever, whoever has an answer first, that's kind of a tough question. So, okay, so as someone who's, I mean, all of us have sort of lived away from Michigan and then came back at some point. So 
Um, something that I think people, well, the first thing people always get wrong is what time zone we're in. Um, that is something that's maybe not Michigan politics related, but it's very funny to me. They're like, oh, well, you're like an hour behind New York, right? And we're like, uh, no, we're also on Eastern Standard Time. So, you know, we're, we're kind of in this weird space and this sort of, you know, sort of is part of our politics too. Um, also, sorry, I live by a train, so you're probably going to hear that right now. Um, but one of the things that's like kind of crazy about this is, you know, we're, we are a Midwestern state, but we are on the Eastern time zone. So we have big cities just like, uh, you know, the East Coast has. We have rural areas. And that's kind of one of the things that I think people are sort of surprised about is our legislature has a lot of farmers in it. Our legislature also has a lot of teachers and nurses and uh, people who have varying career paths. There are Republicans who were former union, um, you, like members of their labor unions and actually vote in favor of labor unions. Um, you know, it's kind of an interesting space um, and something that, you know, people often kind of lump, um, you know, Democrats in as pro-union and Repub all Republicans are not. And in Michigan, that's actually kind of an interesting place because a lot of our state house districts in particular um, have really, really strong union density. And so you see Republicans cross over to vote with their, uh, with their constituents on labor issues all the time. I think a, a thing that anyone who's not from Michigan may immediately assume is that water conservation, the environment is a bipartisan issue that everyone agrees upon because we have big, beautiful lakes and it's just, it just isn't true. There are people I've met, there are people I've debated with who are just like, I could care less. And that's something that I think my campaign has been uniquely pushing is the fact that we've had, for example, lead pipe issues where growing up, I never drunk out of the tap. No one I knew really ever drunk out of the tap. There were time where I, times where I had to take showers with gallons of water because we just did not know what was going to come out of that tap. And, you know, pushing on state and local government to maybe find a way to replace some of that piping in some of these cities, especially urban cities or minority cities that have had this problem for a very long time. And it's things like that that you would think, wouldn't water quality just be something that you know, it's bipartisan. Everyone wants to make sure people are drinking good water. And if you look at cases like Flint, no, that is just not the case. So that's one thing I would say. That is not an issue that is as bipartisan as I even thought it was going to be going into running. Um, I think for starters, I think a lot of people get annoyed that we do this um, with our hands. Uh, but, uh, but in all seriousness, um, I think it's the dichotomy that was brought up. I think like a lot of people don't understand the, the dynamics of the of the unions and how it plays out like mario was saying and, and the environment is just like such a riddle because um you would think that everyone would be on board of taking care of our precious water um and people are quick to be like oh but you guys had flint and i'm like yeah but wait till you hear about our pfos issues um and so like i think from the outside there's just my friends that live out of state are just like we don't understand michigan's identity like are you guys your 2016 red state or are you guys like your 2018 elect powerful women state. And so uh, we'll see what 2020 holds for us. Um, I am hoping uh, that we are close to the 2018, but, um, but yeah, I think, you know, uh, uh, again, similar to what everyone's saying. I think I'm so sorry to jump in, but I wanna make a point because I think what you said here was really critical. Like what, are you the 2016 Michigan or are you the 2018 Michigan? And the thing I wanna make really clear is that for better or for worse, Donald Trump spoke to people in Michigan in some way and it struck a chord with them in some way, right? Um, but Gretchen Whitmer did too, right? There was something in what Gretchen was saying when she was running for governor that really hit home for people. And just like what Ranjeev and Chokwe are doing now and like what we did in 2018, um, you know, we really made sure to listen very carefully and make sure to give solutions that resonated with the people. Um, and for, like I said, for better or for worse, that was the case of what happened in 16. Um, Michigan's kind of a political riddle. Um, it's hard to figure out how, what is going to make this work. Um, but really for us, and I can see it in the passion that these two guys bring to uh, their work in their communities, um, they understand what the people need um, and they speak directly to those issues. Um, and that's, I mean, that's really critical. Um. Starting with Mari and then the others who want to jump in here, can you talk a little bit about the stakes of winning the state legislature this year, of flipping these four seats, um, two of which are, are with us tonight? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the stakes couldn't be higher, guys. I don't want to serve in the minority again. Um, it's been uh, an honor to serve, but 
we could be doing even better things here um, if we are in the majority. Um, cl clearly, the stakes couldn't be higher. In 2018, we missed taking majority in the Michigan House of Representatives by fewer than 3,000 votes across four state house districts. It was within inches, totally within striking distance. Um, and with a really, really robust operation here in Michigan, we think we can do it here in 2020. Um, we uh, have seen an expansion throughout the suburban area here in Metro Detroit in particular, um, where we think that's our path to majority. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing, you know, in 2016, folks talked about the Obama to Trump voter, um, but of course in 2018, there was a lot of conversation around suburban voters, and my district's a great example of that. Um, from 18 to 20, my, uh, from, I'm sorry, from 16 to 18, my district swung uh, nearly 20 percentage points. Um, with that resulted in 16 in a Democratic loss um, and by single digits to a Democratic win in 2018 by double digits. Um, and we think that there's a really, really good shot at seeing that coming across the finish line here, um, particularly in Oakland County, and then hopefully we can bring Chokeway across the finish line with us as well. Um, Rajiv is running in a, uh, in a blue district, so uh, we are, um, you know, fingers crossed, but we think we will be seeing him in the legislature come 2021, but, um, you know, we're going to work really hard to get Chokeway there with us as well. Yeah, on, on my end, I you know I think uh, Rep. Manugian is probably the most first on, on on this issue and the importance of it. But uh, just from my learnings from the outside, uh, it is absolutely imperative that we flip the state house. Uh, as it stands right now, the Republicans control the House and the Senate, and then we obviously um, have, have the, our amazing governor, um, but she needs some leverage in negotiation. As it stands right now, um, we don't have the ability to bring any bills um, uh, up uh, for hearing just because um, you know, we're, we're in the minority. And so that all works with having the gavel. And so something else uh, that's really important um, is that we pass legislation to redraw our lines. And so for the next election in, in 22, uh, we're going to have uh, fair districts that are going to be drawn by an independent commission. And so if we can secure the House in 20, um, and then and then be there for our governor in 22, we also have a chance to hopefully flip the Senate in 22. And at that point, you know, we, we have our, our super majority. And as we all know, that's that's exactly what we're going for. I think from my angle on two fronts, one, it is extremely important for me to flip the state legislature this year, because looking at my life, people I've grown up, grown up with, the communities where I live, a lot of people are very disenchanted with politics. And I think we got one more shot to <laughs> prove some people wrong about how vitriolic and divisive it is and to really get a majority of people who are going to get things passed. Even if you have a Republican Senate that doesn't work with you, people want to see people fighting for them right now. And then also personally for myself, there are a lot of people, especially in the city of Benton Harbor, who have never voted before, who are looking at me and saying, look, you are our best shot to send someone to Lansing who actually understands this community. We need you to do it now. That is a lot of pressure on me. That's why we're working so hard, but also, I think it's incumbent on myself, my campaign, and those who support me to understand that no feat is too hard if we actually work at it. We have got to turn out the vote like we've never, ever, ever seen before because my district, I believe, is also the tipping point. If my district goes blue, I think it's almost impossible for Donald Trump to win the presidency through Michigan because you've never had this area turn out as many Democrats as we're going to, or people who are like, we love you, Shokwe, so we're going to take your advice and vote for the people you say. Because there's a lot of people who are like, you know, you said you said you like them. I'm going to trust you because I'm not into the politics thing. So that's where it's at for me. My community really needs to see someone who cares about them go to Lansing. And the state really needs the chance to give Gretchen Whitmer the allies that she deserves. Like she told me when I met her that you only get representation if you can be that representation. Well, I hope the state legislature and the House can represent her well because I think she deserves it. Great, uh, nerve wracking question because but I promise we won't end on this one. Um, what is keeping you up at night right now? What's making you the most anxious as we stare down the final six and a half, seven weeks before election day? May I, just to get it off my chest. Right. I'm terrified at the situation and I don't wanna scare anyone, please get out and vote at, regardless of what I say. You have to vote regardless you're in a red state, a blue state, a red district, a blue district. Every vote is going to count, but I am terrified at the fact that on election night, we may see some states start to come in with early voting leaning one way and absentee ballots having to be counted. And some people in the media start to call the election one way or another. And there's mass confusion and paranoia because 
no one knows what the truth is anymore. That's why my message so far to every person I've been talking to is you have to get out and vote. And please do not think this is going to be called an election day. It's going to be election week. It's going to be a few days where we're going to have to wait to get the results. And I think I am perfectly fine with that. I've been waiting four years for these election results. I can wait seven more days, I promise you. Just everyone that's listening to this, please stay calm on election night. If it starts to look like it's going one way or another, the final vote count and tally will be legitimate. We just have to wait on it and make sure that every vote gets counted. And like I said, if you're in a blue district, still vote. The popular vote matters. Uh, I think I think for me, um, you know, not to be overly dramatic, but you know, it's just it's just a nightmare. It's 2016, and not reliving that. And so, I think it's campaign 101. Uh, to any good candidate, understands that you always run like you're behind. Um, and I, I know it's cliche, but it's it, there's truer words have never been spoken. And so, I'm afraid of what's happening to our side is that there's a little bit of complacency. You see some of these great polls coming up. You see our path. Um, to, to getting to the numbers we need. Um, and we saw what happened in 2016 with that. And so um, I think I've said it about 10 times today, but I think it's really, really important to not let that descent from the top happen again. I think it's important for all three of us here and anyone running at any level to spur that excitement both upwards and, and downwards. And so, listen, we all know that uh, November is not going to come easy, that there's going to be games be that are going to be played by this federal administration, whether it's on the, the, the absentee ballot side or or just how, how the transition of power works. But uh, the last thing we can do is, is start focusing on those post-election things and, and, and not deliver the results we need to um, at the polls on November 3rd. All right, so mine's a little bit different than voting, although obviously critically important, but um, immediately in like my immediate thoughts are, um, California's like burning, you guys. This is insane. I Like 2020 has been just a crazy, crazy year. And I mean, just a couple of days ago, you know, we were trying to think like, okay, so where can we like travel safely uh, for post-election? Are we going to go up north? Like, what, is, what does this look like? And I'm like looking at Big Sur and I'm like, it would be lovely to like somehow get there, maybe do a road trip or something. And I look at it, I'm like, oh my God, it's like on fire. Like, there's no way that that's going to happen. Um, and so, you know, I think I was asked, I was on a candidate forum before I got on this call and like one of the questions was about uh, our biggest environmental challenge. And I just straight up said climate change. Um, it can encompass all of the different things that we have to look at, like, you know, rebuilding our infrastructure, protecting our Great Lakes, all of those things. But my God, like one of our most beautiful national treasures, um, you know, the percentage of national land in California that's protected, that is burning right now, that is causing so much um, so much harm to our environment and, and to people like kids are growing up in a generation that don't understand or that don't have never experienced a summer without massive wildfires. Um, to me, that's just such a, a critically important thing. And Chokwe hinted at this earlier, like people are not on the same page and not on the level with facts. Um, and so it's really hard to legislate from a place where we can't even agree on the facts to start us out. Um, and I'm just, you know, that's the thing that keeps me up at night is that we can't come to an agreement that we are, you know, living in a um, really, really um, dangerous reality here when it comes to our climate. Okay, flip it because I don't, I'm also anxious now too. Um, <laughs> let's talk about what's giving you hope, what's sparking joy. It could be something personal, it could be something in the news, uh, but what is, what is brightening your day um, right now in whatever small way it can? I'll start uh, since I ended. Um, so I think, I mean, this happened in 2017 when I first started running and it's continued to happen in the time that I've um, been elected and serving. But um, to see like the number of little girls who have like figured out who I am and are inspired by what we're doing is really cool. Um, mostly because I didn't really see, as I was telling you from the jump of the story, like there weren't a lot of like female politicians I really looked up to. Um, the first female politician I really learned about was Hillary Clinton and she wasn't a politician yet. She was the first lady when I was a kid. And so uh, for me, like that's one of the things that really does spark joy is just seeing, um, you know, how not just, and, and not just little girls, although that's something that's really adorable and warms my heart, but you know, to see our constituents um, just respond really positively to any of the communication that we're having with them. Um, it's really something that, you know, keeps me grounded and reminds me of, um, you know, that we're doing really good work. I, I want, oh, Ran, Ranjeev, you want to go? Sorry. I, it's two things for me. One, it's the amount of young men 
that I see who don't care about voting, who have never cared about politics, tell me, okay, where do I go vote? Like, what do I need to do to get you elected? It is so inspiring because there's been this stigma around the community that I'm from that no good, nothing but gangbangers, shooting, drugs, looting. That's all you've ever been. And we're seeing people rise up like there's no tomorrow ready to get out and start to change the community. We're seeing trash getting picked up more. There's just is this, there's this braggadociousness. People are walking around with like, you know, one of ours is running, right? And it's also the, on the flip side, it's the amount of white people I'm seeing. And sorry for the crass language, but literally the amount of white people I'm seeing in my community who are getting my signs, who are saying, we are going to do this together, who are saying, we're gonna transcend our racial divide that's been in this community for 50 or 60 years, where 50 years ago, black men were thrown off of the bridge into the water and murdered. We had a, a march in honor of George Floyd right on that very same bridge where white and black people came together and said enough of this stuff, we're tired of it. And those type of stories are what make me get up every morning and say, I don't care how hard this race is, I've got to get over to the finish line because the amount of work people are putting in is just astronomical. I have uh, two, two small stories. I, I think the first one kind of goes hand in hand with uh, what both of my co-panelists said here is this, this is the representation, how that starts with us. If you look at us three, for example, I mean, this is what Michigan is. Um, and I'm so excited to hopefully change the dynamic and the makeup of the legislator. And it's obviously not just racial or gender based, but there's just so many perspectives that are missing. Um, and I just think bringing unapologetically progressive people into that legislator can help just shape and drive Michigan to the place where it's, it's, it's supposed to be. And so anecdotally, uh, one thing that just made me feel really good, I don't even know if this is the most relevant topic, but um, throughout COVID, uh, obviously, you know, as Mari pointed out, we have a huge environmental crisis. We also have a mental health uh, crisis as well. Um, and so my, my wife, um, who is amazing, and uh, started a, a wine club here locally. And overnight, there was 3,000 members uh, locally. And it was this really cool concept of how you would um, kind of gift wine to uh, uh, someone who posted their story uh, on Facebook and then everyone would return the favor and was kind of just passing it forward. Um, and, but what it did is it, it was one of the few times I've seen in the last four years where just politics were completely taken out of the equation and we saw a community come together. And to Chokwe's point, like we're, there are shared values still, believe it or not. Like it's not as divided as it needs to be. Um, and so any time where I can see just human interaction um, and politics taken out of it, I just think is really, really inspiring just to say that there is, there's hope for humanity. That's amazing. What an incredible wine club she's building. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? So needed. Um, so final question, um, how can people help you? What can they do to get involved with your campaign? What's the most high value add thing they can do to support you? So um, I'm gonna make the plug and I will tell you to sign up for Chokeways in particular because we need to flip his district. But um, if you go to Mobilize, Mobilize is like this amazing site that we're using to kind of capture volunteers. Um, you can find virtual phone banks uh, for all three of us that exist on uh, Mobilize. So you can sign up to volunteer. Um, we have ongoing phone banks all the time um, and we welcome folks from all over the place. Um, a few weeks ago when we did our trial GOTV run during our Democratic primary here, since I ran unopposed, we had amazing volunteers from Vote Save America help make calls for us. And so uh, we were able to really get through our list in the weekend and identify Mari's supporters. So that was amazing. So um, one thing I would definitely do is make sure you go to Mobilize um, and search for uh, either myself, Chokwe, or Ranjeev. Um, and you can find amazing other Michigan candidates as well that I'm promoting on my Mobilize page. Yes, our formula is no different. Um, we absolutely need to win our election and flip this house. Uh, so I think absolutely go to Mobilize um, and, and help uh, any Michigan candidate that you can. Um, and then also, if you know anyone, again, right here in Michigan, uh, District 21, we are doing uh, an aggressive relational organizing and vote tripling exercise. And so we ask that if you don't know anyone in the Canton, Van Buren Township, or Belleville area, just to take one step further. If you've cut a check, cut another check. If you made a phone call, make another one. Um, and I just think if we can all just do something that simple, um, it'll really, really go a long way, not only for us three, but for, for our movement here in Michigan. I can't say anything that much different from what Mari and Ranjeev said. Only thing that I would throw in there is do not allow yourself to two things. One, do not allow yourself to leave anything on the table this year. You have to leave it all on the field, whether that's phone banking, writing another check, finding what you can do to support some candidate somewhere because you do not want to wake up on November 4th or 
in our case, probably November 10th and say, dang it, I didn't do enough. I, I didn't put it all on the line and he skated by with 50 votes. So that's, that's one side of it. Make sure you do whatever you can. And also find a candidate, find someone you're going to phone bank for, you're going to donate to and stay consistent with them because we need as much support as we can get. A lot of us are running against DeVos backed and DeVos funded incumbents who are getting thousands of dollars shelled into them. One of the interesting things in my race is that doesn't seem to be helping my opponent as much as she can't really out fundraise me as much as she'd like to. So those are the things. Find a candidate you can find. My Twitter is in the chat. Sign up, be engaged, because the more people that we can get our message out to, the more likely that this seat is going to flip, because I believe my message is uniquely identifiable and is uniquely able to flip over some of the conservatives in this area who are only voting for the Republican ticket because that's all they know. They've never heard the Democratic side because it's always been preached to them from a certain news organization. Once they hear that, I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican and independent, we both agree on a lot, they'll flip over. So I need your help to get my message out. Amazing. Um, moderator's privilege. I would say the final thing you can do to help run for something uh, is please do make a contribution. We're able to put on these events, um, this and so many others for free because of the generosity of so many supporters like you. So if you're watching this and you wanna help out, runforsomething.net slash build is where to go. Uh, if you've already given or you, or you can't contribute, but you wanna know friends who might, post it on your Twitter, your Facebook, your Instagram, snap it to people, make a TikTok about it. You, know, you, you do you, uh, it, it would mean a lot to us. We're entirely grassroots funded and every dollar goes a long way. Um, we are doing another Unapologetically Progressive event later this month. Um, we'll be talking to folks from Arizona, and I want to get the date right. It is on September 29th. Uh, it's going to be just as exciting and interesting and inspiring. And I will admit, I've been so angry all day about all kinds of stuff. And listening to the three of you talk about what's happening in Michigan makes me feel better. Because if you guys have it under control, then we're, we're going to be fine. So um, thank you for joining us for an hour tonight. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for running and for letting Run For Something be a part of your, uh, your journey. Um, and to everyone who joined tonight, thank you for spending some time with us this evening. Hope you're feeling good too. Bye.